Avram instructing Elias Evan Avram to go and locate a wife for Yitzchak, who's the future matriarch of Klal Yisrael. And he gives him very specific instructions who this woman should be. Anything less than that is not acceptable. And he adjures her. And even if he finds her, if she's not willing to return, he definitely should not negotiate it that Yitzchak should go there. And we had discussed that even though Eliezer is the Evid Nemon, he's the dedicated slave, not only servant, he's Avram's chattel. And they've been through thick and thin together. When he fought the four Malochim, the four mightiest kings, Eliezer was, there's a question, he was the only one in battle together with Avram. And he was Moshe Chalashalo, he oversaw all his financial affairs. And in addition, he was Damesic Eliezer. As the Gemara tells us, it's an acronym. Dolo Mashka B'Torosa Shal Rabo. All the Torah that Avram had learned, which was communicated to him, he had taught Eliezer, and Eliezer disseminated that Torah. I also had mentioned, the Medrash tells us that when Eliezer had come to Base Lovon or Base Besuel, the home of Besuel Lovon, when Lovon had seen him originally, he thought he was seeing Avram Avinu. The radiance that had come out of Eliezer was a semblance of Avram Avinu. He thought it was Avram Avinu. That's how holy the man was. And yet, he adjures him with the, with the Shua to the point that there's no wiggle room, as they say. If in fact he violates this oath, he forfeits a share in the world to come and the physical world. Why was there such a lack of trust? So we said it wasn't a lack of trust. It's since at this moment, he's addressing a mission which is of the utmost importance. Avram Avinu understood who he was and HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, Ki yikor although he was Ishmael, who's the progeny? Who is that chosen seed who's going to address the objective of existence? It's only the seed of Yitzhak. For that seed to be that special seed, as he is special, you need the matriarch to be special. And she has to meet all the criteria to be the appropriate wife to produce that seed that ultimately will address the objective of creation which is Kabbalah Satora. Therefore, he binds him with every level of oath, and Avram Avin takes no chance. And he's very specific. And Eliezer had said, in Posekei, Maybe the woman's not want, going to want to return. Should I return? He doesn't say, Hoshiv, Hoshiv, should I bring back your son to the land that you went out of there? It's an interesting expression. Should I bring your son back there? He says, you should be ultimately careful that my son should not, not go back there. And then he says, and what would be the guarantee that he doesn't go back there? God, Hashem, the God of heaven, who took me from the household of my father and from my birthplace, and what is he giving that? Hashem, why, why is that all important? He says, just, you should not take my son. He should say, but how, how is it going to be possible you're going to find that wife? He should say, 
What does he have to give all this? I mean, Elias in the who Hashem is. Hashem el kei Hashemayim. What's that? She, and he swore to me, Lazar Choetain, what does that have to do with anything? Who Yishlak Malach, what does he have to give all this background on what Hashem had said to him? He had promised him that I'll, I'll, I'll give this land to your, your, your children, so therefore what? So if you take a look over here in the Sepharno, he says something interesting. The Sepharno says, Yishlak Malocho. This is a tefillah. When he said, Hashem will send this maloch, this was a tefillah, a, a, a supplication. Why did Hashem take Avram from Choram? Why did Hashem Hashem will work it out that my son shouldn't have to go back there. Ashadibali. Hashem had said that the progeny, that special seed has come from Yitzchok. Since Hashem had sworn to me that the land is going to be given to my son Yitzchok and to his children, there's no question. If he took me from that location, which that wasn't the appropriate place for me to be, he's going to send his maloch to guarantee that my son shouldn't have to go back there. Because if my son has to go back there, we're going back to, to the very beginning again. I only left there to be able to address what the purpose is. And I'm going to have that special child to address that purpose. So therefore, it should be the will of Hashem that my son should not go back there. So that's what he gives us the background. Since Hashem has sworn to me, the land will be given to your zera, to your seed, your son going back there, if he has to go back there for that wife, that seed is not going to be that special seed to be able to have that. But we'll see in a moment, over here, if the woman doesn't want to come back, then you're absolved from this oath. Only my son should not be brought back there. So Rashi says, what's Rak? Rak is a, is a mute. Rak miutu, bini enu choser. Avo Yaakov ben bini sofa lauzer. My son, Yitzchel, will now go back, but the inference is, but my grandson will go back. I mean, Yitzhak couldn't go there. But Yaakov could go there. Why? Avram Avinu understands, Rak Benilo Soshiv Shema. My son cannot go back there. But Yaakov, it's okay for him to go there. Why Yaakov? Yes, why not Yitzhak? Just simple understanding. This is the kind of question Alan would normally ask. So, I was thinking that, firstly, we find that Yitzchok, when there was a famine and he was about to go to Mitzrayim, Hashem says to him, you should not leave the land. He only was going to go to Egypt because his father went to Egypt when there was a famine. He says, do not go out of the land. It was a famine year. He says, remain here. I will make sure you'll have enough for your flocks, he doesn't go out. So if you take a look in the Yalkut, why did Hashem not want Yitzchok to go to Mitzrayim? Avram went. Hashem didn't say it to Avram not to go. But Yitzchok, he says, under no circumstance should you go. Why? So the Midrash says, it's the Yalkut, which is a compilation of Midrashim, says that just as if you have a korban in the Beis Hamikdash and you take it out of the sanctuary, it becomes invalidated with Psul Pos Yotze. There's an invalidation called Yotze, something that was inside the sanctuary. If you take this korban outside of the confines of the sanctuary, it becomes disqualified and validated with the Psul of, it's called Yotze. It went out of its bounds. If you being the older Tamimah, Yitzchak being that unblemished offering, he was the Akedah, 
you cannot go out of the land because you going out of the land would be the equivalent of taking the carbon outside of the sanctuary and you become possible biyotzei. That's the midrash. So I ask the question: If you have a chatos and olah, saying you consecrate an animal and it's alive, and you take it and you bring it in sanctuary, bring it out of the sanctuary, fact it does not become possible with yosei. It's not. It's not invalidated. It's only invalidated once you started the avod, once you slaughtered the animal, and you received the blood. Then it, it becomes disqualified because in the, you're in the midst of the service. But before you begin the service, it doesn't become disqualified. So Yitzchak, I will post that keda. It's either pre it's either pre or post that keda. So if that's the case, why can't he leave the land? Why does it come become possible biyotze? That's the question I asked on the Yalkut. So what I said, you know, in, on uh, Rosh Hashanah, we say, Afro shel Yitzchak tzavu lefanecha. We find that initially the Malach calls to Avram, Al Tishlach Yotcha Lanar. Do not extend your hand to the Nar, to the land. He was about to slaughter him. So the Midrash says, he said, but let me just make a cut. Even if I don't slaughter him, what did Avram want to accomplish? Meaning, whatever the intent was, if you don't actualize the intent, the effect and the value is not the same. So he wanted to do some action to express and to bring it into reality that initial intent, which was to bring his son as a, as a sacrifice. Hashem says, the mouth, not even to make a cut. All of a sudden he sees, Ayal Nechaz Bisvach. He sees the ram caught in the thicket. And it, the Torah tells us he took the, the Ayal and he brought it, Bemokab Yitzchak Beno. He brought the place of Yitzchok, his son. And it says in the Medrash explicitly that when he slaughtered the ram, he says, this should be the equivalent of slaughtering my son. And when he re received his blood, it should be like I'm receiving my son's blood. And when he sprinkled it, it should be the equivalent. And when he burnt the ram on the on the Mizbeach, it's that. So therefore, it's Afro shal Yitzchok tzorvul fornecho. We say to Hashem, it's the ash of Yitzchok piled before your eyes. So the ram... When it says, Yitzchok, the ram is Yitzchok. Okay? So Yitzchok himself is the atonement for Klal Yisrael. But we say, what's the reason why post, when it's alive, the Avodah hasn't started? Post Avodah, the Avodah is completed. It's concluded. Yitzchok for Klal Yisrael was always still in the middle of the Avodah. Because till the end of time, we need the Akedah to atone for Klal Yisrael. So we're still in the midst of the atonement process. Therefore, Hashem says to Yitzchak, you cannot leave the land. Because since we're in the middle of the avoda, you leaving the land is the equivalent of leaving the confines of the sanctuary, which actually will invalidate the value of who you are. That's the reason why Yitzchak couldn't go outside of Eretz Yisrael. For him to be able to bring about the Yaakov, who he's going to father, that had, he couldn't be diminished as much as Nyota. Once ya Yaakov comes into being, Yaakov would go out of Eretz Yisrael. He could go back to Chorim. It's not a problem. That's firstly. Now, Yaakov, first of all, what does Yaakov represent? Yaakov, we know, is the Av of Gogos. He's the Av who represents exile. No one ex was outside of Eretz Yisrael as long as Yaakov, you know. And he went to, spent those years by Lovon, 14 years for two wives, six years to earn the wealth, two years on the way back. Then he went to Mitzrayim, which was the Golos. Now, we know that each, Mark says in, in Brochos, that each one of the Ovos actually enacted one of the, the Tvilos, Avram Tikin Shachris, Yitzchak Tikin Mincha, Yaakov Tikin Arvis. Now, what's Arvis? Arvis is nighttime. Night is Golos. Why is night Golos? Because we have many questions to ask. As people say, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. 
Yaakov himself can contend with every question that, that exists. Because Yaakov is the Av of Torah. Yaakov is Yaakov is Tamut Yoshiva holding. You know, in the Slichus we say we no longer have the base of Migdush, we'd have the sanctuary, we'd have Rak Shira Torah Zos. The only thing that's left is the Torah which we have. That's the only thing we have. But Torah itself, that will that's we survive through the Torah itself. Yaakov is the Av of survival, because Yaakov personifies Torah itself. So therefore Yaakov could go back. But why did Yaakov have the spiritual wherewithal to deflect whatever the influences of Golos, what they were, was because he was the Amur Torah, because he was the pillar of Torah itself. Yaakov himself raised the, the Shifte Kor, except for Binyam, they were all born in the, under the influence, so to say, within the proximity of Lovon. I mean, how do you raise such a perfect family? The Shifte Kor. The answer is Yaakov Vinu had the ability to insulate, create a spiritual insular environment that nothing could penetrate that environment. And therefore his children were so special. When did the Sheba and Mitzrayim start? When was this Nistamu Eneim V'libin Shal Yisob Ne'ashibut? As Rashi brings, when, when Yaakov passed away. And the morale in Vurs Hashem says that as long as Yaakov is alive, it's as if they were not in Egypt. He created such an insular environment, spiritually speaking, nothing could penetrate that. As long as Yaakov was alive. Once he passed away, then it started to seep in. That, that's that's right. See, we see who Yaakov was. So Yaakov, he's able to deal with all those issues. So I asked, so why when Yaakov passed away? What exactly was so special about Yaakov? He oversaw his family. He created this environment. But what? So what we I once said that we find the other Sakdoshim, Hene Hene Merkava. What was, what was the location of the Shechina before the Mishkan? With the others was, that's where, that's the Merkava. That's, that was the location of the Shechina. It was equivalent of the Kutchin Kedoshim. When you have Hashem's presence at that level, nothing could seep into that. That, could, that, 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 that environment cannot be compromised to any degree. So therefore, Yaakov in Egypt, it's like there's no Egypt. Because the Shechina is with Yaakov. But once he passed away, and the Shechina is not there any longer, the equivalent of the Kodshi Kedoshim, of the Holy Holies, Nistwe named the Liban Shalishot Ne'ashi, but then it started to seep in. Even though there was a physical bondage, but the spiritual bondage, the diminishment, the erosion started at that moment. Any comments?